Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, all around the world, everywhere that you care to look. Tonight is Wednesday night and it's VT talk time, but tonight we have a bazillion and one guests. I'm going to start from closest to me with a young lady who yesterday showed her metal, big style, in great style, and I know that's going to be echoed by everybody else that's with me on the team tonight. Uh, so in the first monast monaster, monaster, in the first... In a onesie, we have Cerulean C, Cerulean C, Lorian from Eke. Good evening, Lorian. How are you doing? I'm okay, thank you very much, Dave. Have you recovered from yesterday? Not wholly, no. I, I'm properly wiped out, I think. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. That's Lorian. In the next monitor is, to me, one of the greats, uh, as I've said this before. He's, he is the godfather of harm reduction. And he's a man that I look up, look up to as a mentor. Um, got one of the calmest personalities I've ever come across. But trust me, I wouldn't ever want to cross him because he'd have you. He's so sharp, <laughs> so rare you like. And that's Jerry Stimson. Jerry, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, Dave. And it was a great day yesterday. Real milestone in uh, what we're doing. Indeed it was. Indeed it was. Now, I'm going to go to camera one no yes number one because we have got a number of other guests and i'm just going to have to call the names out and they'll take the screen but first off we have the man who is behind what happened yesterday at the asig summit and i'm saying that because he's got the screen now but it's absolutely true oliver kershaw oliver congratulations on yesterday what an absolutely splendid affair it was that's very kind of you but uh, it, i mean it wasn't just me it was uh, it was my colleague Neil and, uh, and uh, Amanda from Smooth Events. Yeah, it was a, a big team effort to get yesterday to happen. Indeed, uh, but uh, it, it was it was an amazing thing. Next to uh, Oliver, we've got our very own Daz, Darren Johnson, who made the trip down with us yesterday. Daz, good evening to you. Good evening, everybody. Hello. Have you recovered yet? Because you I were have, wrecked yes, last I've night. Just about recovered now. You have. Yes, took us all the other day as well. Well, that's good. And and the other one of the other members of the team that travelled all the way down from the northeast is Mark Jones. Mark, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Yes, uh, I've almost recovered, I think. You have, have you? <laughs> yeah. It was a, it was a hell of a day. It has to be said. The other member of the team that is with us is one Gary Dibley. Gary, you there? Yeah. Good evening. And uh, yeah, again, like to echo the, the, the thanks for all the organisation that went into yesterday. It was a, a good day from from the bit that I was there for. Absolutely fantastic. And bringing up the rear is. Oh, hang on. Who's this coming in? This is going to happen a lot. We don't know who it is. I'll, I'll go with where I was and say bringing up the rear is the effervescent loveliness, the bountilicious babe of the one and only Sav. How are you doing, Sav? I'm fine. I'm not sure I like the bringing up the rear bit, though. But, that, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm good. Thank you very much. Could have been worse. And I see we've been joined by somebody that looks an awful lot like Mark Shaw. We have. Good evening, Hello. Mark. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Hi, Mark. How are you doing? Excellent. Yeah, good, good. Brilliant stuff. Hang on one second. I, just, I don't know why, but it seems like my computer's dying on me at the moment. Again? Yeah. Oliver, can I ask you, when you, if you're not actually speaking, can you mute? Because you keep on pulling the screen. Thanks, Bonnie lad. Makes life easier. Um, are you, you sorting it out now, Mark? Yeah, it seems to be okay. You just said it kept coming up saying my microphone wasn't working, but obviously it is if you hear me. Patently it is, yes, because we can't. Um, and there you are. That is the lineup for tonight. Now, we're going to take as long as we take tonight to talk about what went on yesterday at the ESIG Summit, which, in my view, is one of the most important events on the calendar this year in terms of ESIGs and where they are at. We heard from all sorts of people. Not only that, but it was reported all over the world and in fact just just to kick things off i'm going to play a little bit of video in that uh, that came up from al jazeera um and this will give you a flavor of what the world has been reporting and it's 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 so interesting um here it comes play you swine 
This may not be a normal tobacconist, but the owners of this shop believe they're onto a good thing. It's a store dedicated to vaping, that is, smoking an electronic cigarette. Smokers wanting to kick the habit can choose their pipe kit, the flavor, and even the strength of nicotine liquid they want to vape. A healthy alternative, they say, to smoking real cigarettes. I'm not a doctor, but I'm, I have smoked for 12 years, more than 20, 25 cigarettes per day. And I, quick for, I stopped six months ago, and I feel my body completely different than before. The health risks of cigarettes have been widely known for decades. Smoking has been seen increasingly as an antisocial habit. But with these cigarettes, it's a different situation. For a start, there's no smoke and much less of the associated problems. And many here at this e-cigarette conference believe it's time to distinguish between smoking and vaping. There are questions surrounding the use of e-cigarettes. Do the benefits really outweigh the risks? And do they really help people to quit smoking? Well, part of the problem is that there is mostly anecdotal evidence surrounding this issue. And there are only a few rigorous studies that examine whether they really are healthier for you than actual cigarettes. Those in favor say the benefits of vaping can't be ignored and that it's time to change attitudes to combat the effects of smoking. WHO estimates that a billion people will die from smoking in the 21st century. Now, if you could get a substantial number of people to use these products rather than smoke over the long term, you could possibly save hundreds of millions of lives out of that one billion death, to uh, that one billion death toll. But e-cigarettes have not been around for long, so there's no long-term evidence for other side effects. Like normal cigarettes, they are addictive, and it's an opportunity for the big tobacco companies to take advantage of their mass appeal. If you're selling an addictive product and e-cigarettes are addictive just like cigarettes are, then you've got a massive potential opportunity to make vast sums of money um, out of the public and that's why you need to control the marketing. For now, scientists are cautiously welcoming e-cigarettes as a viable alternative. In the short term, it may be a way of avoiding some of the harmful illnesses such as bronchitis and emphysema associated with smoking. The long-term effects, though, are still a long way from being known. Sonia Gallego, Al Jazeera, London. Whoops. And that, that's, that's the Al Jazeera video. That's what got played out. And it struck me that that was, I thought at any rate, a very, very positive piece. Um, anybody else, I, I presume that everybody on the panel seen that. Um, what did you make of it, Lorian? Aside from the fact that they zoomed in on your lips. Yeah, that was weird. Um, it's, you know, to be honest, it is a good piece. Um, I know Al Jazeera, a lot of people don't know of Al Jazeera as a news, out, a news network, but they're, they are quite well respected. It's not um, a bad thing to have something positive like that go out, to be honest. It's good. Yes, I thought so. Gary, I'm, I've got you on screen. You've seen it. What did you think? Fantastic piece. Um, really good. Long overdue, I thought. Sorry, Most I'm, definitely. I'm, yes, I'm not. I'm not switching between cameras very well at all. I'm. I'm still a bit, <laughs> still a bit train lagged. Um, I think we probably should really start right at the beginning of the day with the, uh, the first presentation that was made, um, and of course, that was um, Dr. Lynn Dawkins who was was talking about e-cigs. Um, Daz Johnson. Your opinion, when you were sitting listening to Lynn Dawkins, what, uh, what did you make of that? The, uh, the presentation overall, I thought, was very good. Um, if, you, if you weren't a vapor and you knew very, very little about um, electronic cigarettes, she, she, overall she did a fantastic job of explaining um, of the research, what she's done, um how 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 long she's been and i mean what i loved about it as well as you know she she said um like a lot of the others like if if she's had any impact from the uh the tobacco industry or the electronic uh, electronic cigarette agency regarding funding told her about all her past and her history how long she's been doing the research for um and i loved it because it was really understandable um what she she um she was talking about you know i could really relate to it and i felt that anybody who didn't know a lot could really also relate to um electronic industry sorry electronic cigarettes as a whole um particularly when she mentioned like first second and third generation which i let somebody else explain but it was um it, it was really really easy to relate to very very good piece 
Yes, I think it's uh, I think it's safe to say that uh, her 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 exposition of, of uh, the first, second, and third generation was simplified in the way that we would look at it, I suppose. But uh, but nonetheless, it was uh, it was quite accurate. Um, I mean, I've got the full set of slides here, and I should say that they are all available on the eSigSummit.co.uk or .com. I can never remember which, but the eSig Summit site. It's worth going to have a look uh, to see what it says. Um, the bit that I found interesting in what she was talking about was uh, the who uses them bit. Did anybody else pick up on all of that? Mm. Yeah. Lorian? Yeah. yeah, that was me that ums. Yeah, well, kind of her, her rundown of it was um, a younger age group than, we've, than we, we've been told sort of the average age is around 45, 40. And she certainly seems to be intimating it was actually a bit younger than that. And they were well-educated um, kind of group of people it was actually quite a positive group of people that she she painted rather than a bunch of old people who were a bit weird and a bit peculiar yeah uh, are you calling me peculiar never um, would i do such or, a thing. Or, or, or any of us <laughs> I, I, I must admit i did find that the the patterns of use in regular users was uh, was quite an interesting piece um and it, it it's interesting to look at this that 18 percent of people this is worthy of note 18 percent of people use siggy lakes the second generations, the egos, 72% of people are on egos, and 9% are on mods, third generation stuff. And the strengths that are used, 18 milligram, 11 milligram, combined strengths 21%, and only 1% on zero milligram. And the preferred flavor is tobacco, followed by fruit, 33%, and then mint and menthol, 28%. I, that made me feel very, very good. I know I'm not alone in not liking mint and menthol. Um, Mark, here's a question for you because yes. you, you're a vendor. Um, how does what, what Lynn came up with figure with what you see in terms of sales? Uh, it's obviously the most most common part of anybody. But the reason being for that, usually that, that's usually when they're first starting out and then you find after their business for a month or so people start to take interest in the flavours and, and to be honest I find that most of my customers tend to slowly shift away from the tobacco flavours but literally first time everybody coming to the to the stall they want a tobacco flavour and I think maybe that's where them figures are coming from because as I say they do tend to shift away and once they try the sweeter flavours they tend to you know experiment a lot more and it's very rare that I find that who tends to stick with the one flavour, if you get what I mean, like just the tobacco. But predominantly, first off, they want a tobacco flavour. They want the closest thing to the cigarette that they can possibly find. Yeah, yeah. In, you know, I, I was quite taken aback by this, in fact, by the whole day, because it was a very, very in-depth, um, ac very academic kind of day. Um, but one of the reasons I'm so pleased Jerry is here, because I, I want to try and get some flavour as to whether... The kind of detail that we went into yesterday in terms of who uses what and, and, and in fact all of uh, Lynn's presentation about this thing, is that the kind of detail that the, the normal academic conferences go into, Jerry? They'd normally go into a lot more detail and be um, a lot more boring. I think we had some very good and lively um, presenters yesterday who could actually get across a lot of key information very quickly. On this question of who is using what, I think Lynn Dawkins' data are rather distorted because she's got a rather biased sample. And we need to get a better handle on the volume of sales across the three different major categories of, 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 of product. And I think that we need to persuade Robert West to do that in his surveys. We'll come on to Robert West in a minute. Mm. I mean, if you think about the the, the people who are in the game at the moment. I mean, if you think of the volume of sales from e-lights, for example, um, you, you know, I, I would begin to doubt a little bit whether Lynn Dawkins' figures are correct. I would have put the percentage using cigar likes higher than, than than she has. Yeah, I, I must admit, I'd always uh, I'd always kind of assumed that the the percentage of people using the cigar likes was going to be more towards the the forty five percent, fifty percent because that's where the bulk of people have come in the last 
year or so when, the, when we've seen this massive growth in figures. And I'm, I'm not sure how quickly they move on. And again, I'm going to refer back to Mark Shaw uh, because Mark's, he's at the leading edge. He's selling all of this kind of stuff. So Mark, in, in your customers, you know, somebody that starts, I don't know how many cigar lakes you move, but people that are on cigar lakes, how long do they stay there before they move over to the generation two and generation three stuff? I don't sell cigar lights. I sell the basic kit I sell is an ego. Uh, I'd tell people, we used to have a couple of cigar lights on the store for people to try, and then I'd say to them, try this, try an ego. And basically they'd go, wow, straight away, they'd see the difference straight away. I don't, I don't actually sell the cigar lights, but I get quite a lot of customers come up and they've already got a cigar like, and you know, they seem to get on with it, a, a lot of them, and, but it's half and half that we get coming up saying these things are no good and the other half saying yeah I get on with it quite well and probably do myself out of business I have most of the people with the rechargeable cigar light how to refill them <laughs> so as I say I don't actually sell them myself indeed now Sav I'm thinking that chat's probably had a lot to say about this because a fair few of them have started with cigar lights have we got any, indi any indication from them how long it took them to move off them and onto second generation I haven't got that, but we've got an interesting comment that came from Russell Ord, and oh. he says, Cigar Lakes um, Eagles seem regional. Where there's a vaping shop, Eagles are more predominant. If you haven't and you're relying on supermarkets, that's where your Cigar Lakes are more in the thing that everyone's using. That makes, that actually makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense because thinking about it, um, somebody was asking on Twitter, uh, about a bricks and mortar in Hartlepool because they were going there to visit. Now they have one and it is noticeable that in Hartlepool you don't see as many cigar lakes and you do see more egos kicking about. Is that the same in your part of the world, Lorian? Uh, in my part of the world you see more egos. Um, was, well, just When you were saying that I was just thinking about this but then my nearest bricks and mortar shop is about an hour's drive away, the best part of an hour's drive. So that, that having access isn't an issue here. People are buying it online. And I wonder if you're not really exposed to either or, people are doing it online. There's no question around here, it's egos and even this kind of thing. It's very rarely seasick likes. Well, let's, let's, let's go around the rest of the panel. Um, we'll go to, to Gary because he's in, in another part of the south. What's it like down there, Gary? Do you see cigar likes or egos? Uh, no, no cigar likes, to be honest with you. It is mainly egos. And... Just recently, outside the, the gates of my daughter's school, I drop her off every Thursday morning. There are a few, I've seen a, a few mums sort of uh, sticking the uh, the ego away before they drop the kid off uh, and getting it back out again when, when they go. Um, and, and it seems to be more and more the norm. I'm, where I currently work is a shop front sort of office. And I see people walking up and down with, with you know, the ego type all the time. Um, I've yet to see somebody with a cig light to be honest with you. Well, and let's, let's go to Oliver Kershaw, because you're right in the middle of London, aren't you, Oliver? What's, um, it, like, what's it like there? Do we see cig lights or...? It's a real mix in London. Um, so I, 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 see, I see both. Um, but but just, just interestingly, um, I, I had a chat with Ricardo Pelosi yesterday about this, and um, we were talking about kind of what, what's seen across, across Europe. And um, it, it, to my mind, goes back exactly to what I think. Um, I'm not sure you said it about the uh, the 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 the, the, fiction, the, uh, the vape shops. Paris, for example, um, you see now in Paris more egos than you see cigarettes. I mean, real cigarettes. Really? What you walk around Paris, and this is Paris. I mean, Paris might as well, you know, be, be the home of smoking. I mean, it's pretty extraordinary. Yeah, but but then Paris has has probably a dozen bank stores. Wow! In the centre. In the centre. It, it's 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 phenomenal, really, when you think about it, isn't it? That here we have what I thought was uh, counterintuitive. I would have thought that were, there were more cigar lakes, and it's looking from our experience. I thought you had one in your hand there for a minute, Jerry, just out the corner of my eye. There's <laughs> a pencil, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was just sitting there thinking, wow, what else? Jerry's well, joined us. Um, yeah, it does seem counterintuitive. You would think that there'd be a lot more um, cigar lakes, and certainly in, um, around the area around here, 
very, very local to me, because there isn't a bricks and mortar of any description anywhere close, I do see a fair few cigar likes, but I'm seeing more and more and more egos now. And I think the only reason that I'm seeing the cigar likes is because we're seeing more and more people starting to take it up. And as we've said in the here's hour, something that looks like a cigarette is obviously going to be more attractive. Um, Daz, what's it like in Horden? You're muted, Daz. Daz can't unmute. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you what I've got from chat while Daz figures out how to unmute his mic. I got that by the way of an arms he's having Carry to on. <laughs> I manage, but carry on. Anyway, All right. So. Uh, from chat, Andy. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Andy D said, uh, Sigal like the second generation, it took three weeks and four more weeks to move to mods and atties. Mm hmm. Miles Dolphin says, three days from Sigalike to Ego, three weeks later, first mod. Mm -hmm. Neil Ash has said, anyone who uses the internet will know their stuff better than Sigalikes in a very short time. Took me about two weeks. Mm -hmm. Vape and Sam says, I agree with Russell. Market availability will dictate uptake. Safer Six has said, our biggest seller is the Light Ego kits. They just run, run out the door. Very, very popular. He needs to put a baby gate up. That'll stop them. <laughs> <laughs> and six gone says Sigalex for a week after that ego and MVP, and MP said Sigalex are the best gateway to vaping for the majority of the population. No, he's just said exactly what I was thinking, that Sigalex are a gateway product, a gateway <laughs> out of smoking into yeah. vaping. It's absolutely. Would you agree with that, Jerry? Well, yeah. I mean, I listen to this, and I think you know we can talk all we like about what seems to be going on locally and what's you know what people do, and you know I take that about the the move from cigarettes to second generation and, and so on, and how you know people are going to get more effective products um, that way. Um, but the question is actually fairly easy to answer if you get Robert West to ask that question in his regular survey, what are people buying, or if you get Ash to ask that in their surveys, or even if you get Esita to try and do, you know, amongst the various companies, get some quick calculations about volumes of sales because mm -hmm. it's, it's an important question, you know, who's using what. It's important for two reasons, but it's important for us who are advocates because most of the advocates are on second and third generation and are we reaching the people on cigar likes who should also be writing their MPs and all the rest of it. And my guess is we're probably not reaching them and they're not involved as much in the advocacy and they don't know about it. It's an important question also in terms of regulatory policy because as we know from the discussions, you know, it's going to be easier to get cigar likes through uh, a medicines regulatory system than it is to get other um, products. So, you know, the more we know about who's using what and who's using what at what stage in their vaping career, if you want to look at it that way, um, it, it's all important in terms of the arguments that we've got to, we've got to put up. Yes. Can I, can I just add something on top of that as well? Because um, when I started vaping back in February 2012, I started on 510. Now, I had that 510 for a month, and then I went on to um, an ego. And I just think out of interest um, as well, it, it would be interesting to see, like, these people who are using first generation how, and who are moving on, how long they're actually on. the Like, if it's a cigar like, how, how long have they been using the cigar like and why they feel it necessary to, to get, like, something like an ego, um, you know, why did they come off it in the first place? I came off it because I found that at first it, it, it was good, but it just didn't deliver what I wanted, which is why I then um, looked for an ego on recommendation. And I just think out of interest, it would be a very valid point to see what other vapors, you know, out there are doing, you know, if, they, if they're doing like the same sort of thing. Yeah, well, absolutely right. Absolutely right. And uh, as we've said, it's, it's something that, that, that Robert West um, and, and his smoking toolkit study can actually look at um, on behalf of everybody out there. And we're going to be talking about Robert West after the break, which we'll take now because that's it's kind of a seamless link and we're trying to be dead professional. That's not going to last for the whole of the show, <laughs> I can almost guarantee. So uh, I'm going to recharge my glass while the adverts are on. You might like to do the same. We'll be back in two minutes, but please don't go anywhere. See you in two.
Vibber and I Vibber Elixir, based in Yorkshire, for your AC needs. That's iVibber.co.uk and iVibber-Elixir.co.uk. iVibber and iVibber-Elixir.co.uk, proud sponsors of VibberTrails.tv. And we are back live here on Wednesday night, the uh, the 13th of November, the day after the EC Summit, which, as I said earlier, I think is uh, going to be a pivotal, pivotal event in the life of ASICs around here. Now, while we were on the break, there was a little conversation going on between Laurie and, and uh, Jerry, which I'd like you to do again, please, because I caught the back end of it, and it was <laughs> extremely interesting, and it does lead into what Robert West had to say. So, Lorian, it's over to you. Not word for word, but generally, I wanted, what I was asking Jerry is how you work out in terms of statistics um, the usage from market data for SIGA likes and uh, refillable devices and how you then equate that to how many people are using um, refillable devices based on the amount of fluid sold, and, and which is easy to do for something which you buy by a stick, um, like with tobacco. And I, I don't know how that would work out that you could make decent statistics out of it. Jerry? Yeah, you, you raise a very interesting question which I hadn't thought about because it's easy to count up sticks, but when you're trying to extrapolate uh, volume of liquids, I mean, a person buys an ego and uses it for a long time and gets refills, so you'd have to calculate up the volume of nicotine used from the, the refills. But even as a start, if we, if we didn't look at the, the, the sales data, I think it's good to have the sales data. If we didn't look at the sales data, if we looked at something like Robert West's um, survey, that could be a, a start, you know, when you, he says, I think 10% of current smokers are using e-cigs. Well, if we, if we find out what proportion of that group are using different kinds of products, I think that would give us an idea of the, 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 the popularity. I mean, neither the, neither the approaches is, is, is terribly complicated, but it does need a bit of thought about how you extrapolate from, you know, uh, you know, if you're looking at sales, how you extrapolate from uh, the sale of different types of products into what that means into uh, in terms of regular usage. Yes, it, it, it's um, it's it's a knotty question, and I've just been bringing up uh, Robert West's slides. Uh, now, I know. Uh, could, could, can I just interject? Yeah. When you look at the the stock analysts' reports from the U.S., which are you know, looking at increasing volumes of um, e-cigarettes sold and their estimates of how that will overtake uh, tobacco cigarettes within a decade. That's Bonnie Herzog's projection. They are basing that entirely, I think, on cigar-like projections and not on um, other products. That's that. That's a very interesting one because, judging by the figures. Can we, shall we agree to, to, uh, to take Lynn Dawkins' figures as being in the ballpark, just, just for the, the, the case of tonight's conversation? And if that's the case, we're, we're talking in terms of that's a very small part of the e-cig market, and they expect that to overtake smoked, lit tobacco within 10 years. But if you were to put all of the Generation 2 and Generation 3 e-cigs on top, we could be seeing that an awful lot quicker. Isn't that the case? Oliver, what do you think? I, I've been trying to explain to, to uh, Bonnie Herzog and to others that uh, the, the stock analysts are, are missing the big picture. That they're, they're essentially going on, um, on IRI data. They're going on the sales data that is patched through on a, a point of sale. And as we know, a point of sale, it's all cigarettes. As we're talking about you know the big the big chains the big super stores. so that's where they're getting the data from really um, and uh, again caveats about Lynn's research it was a self-selecting example it doesn't necessarily paint the full picture um, you know if you'll say that it's, you know, nobody's trying to whitewash it um, it's, it's hard to get answers to these questions but boy is she trying I mean she's, she's starting a new study very soon and you know the, Dream is uh, the cigarette sellers to take part. Unfortunately, the cigarette sellers don't have very much motivation to, to 
you know, investing in all of this is, is the commercial pressure. So you like to do very well for a lot of people. Um, that you know, it's all in the margins, isn't it? And the distribution, the ease of distribution, of getting it. You know. mm. uh, what needs to happen is is the ego devices uh, need to start getting pushed by, by you know by, by everybody. Um, I say need because uh, because I, I think we all agree that, that, that the ego device is, is the one that gets people off cigarettes, right? I think so, yes. So when we talk, I mean, we, we say that intuitively. We need the evidence, of course. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's that's my view anyway. Indeed, indeed. So have you got anything to add to that? Um, there's been an awful lot of chat going on, um, which I can't even begin to, to grab. But there's one comment that I'm going to read out from Andy D before we move it on. Is, um, he says, sorry, but segregating the classes of what is used makes it far easier to regulate, uh, to regulate a section and ban the rest. It's far better for our case and the fight to count every vaping device as one user. What is used doesn't matter. The valid part is they vape rather than smoke. And 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 I would agree. I would agree with that absolutely. That was why I was saying that you know if if Herzog um, and the other analysts are looking purely at stick battery cigar lakes, they need to be counting everything else in because their projections will change, and it's it's largely because it would appear that we don't know what the actual percentages are, which is why I was saying, you know, might it be worthwhile taking um, Lynn Dawkins figures for granted just for the, for the time being to give us something to work from. Because if they are right, then the likes of Wells Fargo, when they're looking at all of this kind of thing, their predictions are actually well out of kilter. Because according to Lynn Dawkins, there are more people using egos and third generation than there are using cigar lakes. Um, they're all e-cigs, I've said this before. An e-cig is an e-cig. And it doesn't matter whether you like it or not, somebody else is enjoying it somewhere and we're all vapors together, as we, we should be. We probably actually better really go on to, to what Robert West had to say because that, I think, might be a little more accurate and might give us a little bit better idea. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it to Sav on this one because I know you took copious notes and I saw the smile on your face while you were doing it. And I know you enjoyed what Robert had to say, so it's over to you. Right, well, I've highlighted the bits that, that I was very, very interested in. Um, one of the things that he did say was um, no evidence to say that e-cigs undermine the motivation of people who want to quit smoking. And I thought that was a very interesting topic that he was working through because he was talking about the uses of NRT and he said the use of everything bar e six has gone down when he was talking about quit attempts and I found that all very very fascinating because he said cigarette smoking has gone down but the use of nicotine is not declining and one in ten ex-smokers use e six daily and one in six have tried them or used them occasionally and I found that all really fascinating Indeed, um, absolutely right. I've, I've just been putting the slide up on screen there, as you might have been able to see, and the, the data that he's gathered is, pff, it's actually quite amazing. And you, you can see um, on, on this particular graph how the amount of nicotine used is rising at the expense of cigarettes used, which I think is, is very interesting. Um, and here on this one, the prevalence of nicotine in cigarette use, you can see at this side, the green line being cigarettes, how they appear to be dropping, but the nicotine is climbing, which is, it's got to be good. It's got to be good. Um, I'm losing the will to live with buttons here. I've got too many things to press. Um, I, can I just jump in there? You Dave? can, anytime um, you like. I mean, I think what was quite stunning was the fact that um, I think one in three quit attempts now, to use his language, it involved e-cigs. You've got declining use of NRT and declining use of NHS stop smoking services. So the whole picture within kind of a year or a couple of years is shifting quite dramatically in what people are doing to move away from smoking. Um, I think it's very interesting that Robert 
at the beginning of the year was rather doubtful about e-cigs. He was saying, well, they're just going to take away from NRT. There's not going to be any net gain. There's not going to be much change. But he's really detecting in his data how e-cigs are taken over from every, you know, nearly everything else as, as, a, as a very important vehicle for people um, moving away from smoking. And that in turn has led him to be much more positive. And you've got to um, remember that you know Robert West is one of the sort of the top three or four smoking researchers, and the message that he is putting across is listened to by people. Uh, that secondary point about the total volume of nicotine remaining the same that caused a little bit of discussion, but of course that doesn't really matter. It only matters if you're worried about people using nicotine, and there were quite a few discussions during the day about does it matter if people use nicotine or not. Um, he was sort of pretty sanguine about that. Others were a bit worried about that. But, um, you know, as we all know, if people are using nicotine, enjoying nicotine, but they're not smoking it, no problem. So I think Robert West is becoming an ally. He was strongly, strongly-ish in favour of med regs. I, I think he is moving on that. Um, mm. But, uh, you know, others have to move as, as well. A uh, very, very interesting presentation from somebody who's been rather a doubter, uh, but who is very led by the evidence. Yeah. That's that's the impression I got as well. And I've got to say, sitting listening to what he had to say, every time the, the subject of Medregs came up, I got the impression that he was not massively in favour of med regs but i want to ask gary dibley because he was sat there and i was watching his face <laughs> during the course of that did you pick that up as well gary did you get the impression that that, that robert west was kind of saying actually med regs no the, the one thing he kept saying was there is no problem at the moment w were you picking up on that i was yeah i mean like you say it was it was a lot to take in during the the sort of the, there was a lot packed into those sort of 30 minute segments and I've been trying to sort of go back through the slides and stuff and, and break it down in, in my, home, my own head because, you know, small brain and all that stuff. But um, it, it was definitely aiming at that. And, and to that point, everything seemed very, very positive in terms of the, you know, the, the figures and, and the quotes and, and this and the other. It just seemed very, very positive to that point. And there was nothing, you know, to that point that made me think, hold on a minute, you know, it, it was very very positive like I say there was no there was no sort of um he wasn't pushing down that direction for the regs that that was what i that was what i picked up mark jones was making copious notes as well mark what did you make of it well i was getting the feeling that he was he was having a shift in his own mind of from where he'd been to the way he was going of like i said there was no problem with uh, using nicotine at the moment so why go to all the extra expense and trouble of doing something about it. Mm. Well, exactly, yes. I mean, it, it, I took a great deal of heart at that point in time because prior to yesterday, uh, really my take on it was that Robert Robert had been looking particularly at, uh, at Med Regs. Now, he, I know he did say yesterday that he wasn't there representing Cancer Research UK, uh, of which he is a committee member, board member, whatever it is, but he, he's a very influential man and I just wanted to ask Jerry and, and I, it, it, this is pure speculation so nobody's going to hold you to anything or anything like that D do you think knowing what you know of Robert West and how the likes of cancer research works do you think that there's any likelihood that he might have influence on them to actually come out and say yeah what we said in 2007 is right um, these things shouldn't be medicines that's a difficult call. I mean, I, I'm still trying to work him out on this. And I think that the way he is going to play it is being the cautious scientist to provide solid evidence about what's happening and others have to draw their conclusions from what he's saying. I, I, he's not one of those scientists who's going to argue, I think, strongly that you know, against or for medrex. I think that, that's the way he's going to play it now, you mm. know. Um, and you know you got to respect people for that. You know you don't have to take a strong policy or political side. And he his strength is providing very solid data, which people look at, and um, you know they respect him uh, for that. 
uh, in the corridors, as it were, I suspect you know his his less publicly spoken views on this are going to be important, and I detect that he now sees the Medregs approach as probably a, a bit of a nonsense. Although I know he supported it earlier in the year, uh, he was one of the people who favoured that terminology of nice in, of, of licensed nicotine products. Mm. Uh, but you know. Um, <laughs> In 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 vaping, in vaping, a year is you know a lot can happen in a year in, in the politics of vaping. I mean, it's just extraordinary to think how many twists and turns have been since the beginning of the year. So I, I think he's becoming more of an ally. But whether he will stand up as Peter Hayek might, you know, I, I don't think we're going to see that from Robert. No. Um, and while while you were speaking, he said, switching back to the camera, um, the hangouts crashed. <laughs> <laughs> which is interesting so ah, they're coming back in slowly but surely um, while, but while they're doing that Lorian what did, what did you make of what Robert West had to say I, I, well I think overall it was very it was massively interesting um, and the fact that he said that nicotine use is staying about the same but the use of tobacco is dropping as is the use of NRT products um, and he specifically referred to Champix and stuff what I actually wanted to say though is on the Robert West front, um, I did speak to him afterwards when the whole thing was finished and we were still sat at the table, he, he was sat next to me um, and we did have a conversation and firstly I want to say he does not believe the gateway argument, categorically he thinks the gateway argument is nonsense. Yes. Um, he also was very surprised when I started talking about how we, how we inhale and how long the in inhaling is um, and the nicotine that I was using, he was really shocked. And I think he realises that he's still got a lot to learn about how people are actually using them um, and how important the habit stuff is, which, he, I tell you what, he was such a nice man, genuinely nice man. He is. Um, and I fully suspect that if you could sit down with him with a beer and have an hour, a couple of hours, just talking to him as a vapour and explaining the situation, um, I think you'd, you you could see a big movement. I don't know what his power is. I don't know. I say you're right. Jerry probably knows all that stuff. But certainly, I I felt with my five ten minutes with him, there's a lot of movement there. Yes, it's it's funny you should you, you should mention vapors sitting down and speaking to uh, to people on on this level. Uh, that was happening quite a lot. Not in the uh, in the meeting room per se, but we for for benefit of those that weren't there, we had a table set up filled with mods um, and not just mods there was there was generation one generation two and generation three devices um, and and the team the vttv team that was down there was kind of manning the tables and and uh Lorian was there as well and a few others and so many people came up to us to ask about them and and seeing as how mr dibley's on the screen as it were and he was he was part of that he got a little bit embarrassed when people were picking mods you'd made up weren't you but what did you make of that there were so many questions gary it was the the i think the the most shocking thing well not shocking but there were a lot of people that were if you like vendors that just didn't have a clue of of some of the devices on the table now understandable but you know a lot of a lot of the people were just coming up and and yeah, I say they were they were gobsmacked to be honest with you with some of the stuff. That's, that that's was there. the word. That is the yeah. word. Yeah. But if if carry on, Gary. Sorry. Yeah, I, w I was saying it, it, they they were definitely sort of looking as in you know they they just done. I think if if you were looking at if you like the first break, they just had the introduction to the. Um, you know, generation one, generation two, generation three, um, and I was quite happy that even the mint tin mob got a mention within the generation three. But even when they come outside after seeing that, they, they, they were sort of a look of sh almost not shock, but but you know, what are they um, <laughs> on their faces? Even though they'd just gone through, you know, the, the first bit of the the speech, you know. Yeah, I want to bring Sav in here as well because she was stood there, and the comments we we were discussing this on the train coming back. And some of the comments that were made by various different people. Um, Sav, go on, fill people in. <laughs> it was amazing. I mean, but it, I, it was just constant. There was people coming up, going, "So, I've never seen anything that looks like that. We've seen the ones that look like cigarettes." And they're going, "So, so are these homemade?" And it was like, "Well, no, these are all custom made. These you can buy everywhere." And we're like, 
I, I, I don't. It's amazing these things even exist, and they were just gobsmacked. And the question: So why is that different to that? And why would you use that over that? And how would you fill it? How? What? What? What does power control do? And there was just question after question after question. They were amazed, and the amount of photographs people. Do you mind if we take pictures of these? We've never seen anything <laughs> like it. it. It was. It was absolutely fantastic that that. There was one Chinese bloke. I don't know who his name, what his name was, but he was he was very interested in the Inukin range. And somebody did mention a little bit later on. I think he was from Fastec. <laughs> <laughs> I am expecting one of my mods to be cloned shortly. Oh, I think I, I think they'll all be cloned shortly, Gary. I think that's where all the photos were going. What was? Sorry, Gary. Go on. No, it's Jerry interrupting. Sorry, I mean, it's Jerry. Fascination. I mean, if you look at the list of people who were there, you know, you've got people from industry, you've got people from e cig companies, you've got consumers, you've got people from universities, Department of Health. They should all know quite a lot about this. You know, some of those are decision makers and really powerful people. Yes. And the level of ignorance there still is about the product is is just scandalous because people are pronouncing on these things and talking about them and there were people who got up and said well i've never seen this before and there are people who are working in you know stop smoking clinics or they're, they're you know wherever and um you know we just got to do a whole lot of continued sort of awareness or raising about what is out there and what people are, are using and i i just find it pretty sad that you know people who are in powerful positions and who are making decisions about these things are just not actually doing their proper investigation, their proper research to find out what's going on in the world. Yeah, I, th I think that's partly down to the fact that they don't know where to research and what to look for. And I think a large part of the information that they'll have been given will have come from the likes of Ash, the likes of yeah. the MHRA, uh, and, and authoritative bodies like that that you would normally expect to be giving you the whole yeah. story. Um, but when you when you consider what the BMA has been doing, for instance, I had we put Vivian Nathanson in front of that table, I suspect she'd have had a conniption fit, passed out, and needed an ambulance when she'd seen them, because it would have blown the whole renormalisation theory out of the water. Yeah. One one thing that did strike me particularly, and Sav was at my side for this one there was a representative of Big Pharma, and I'm not going to name the company because I can't pronounce it. And he was looking at these devices. He took photographs, he picked them up, he fondled them. It was like a VIP advert in reverse. <laughs> it really was. He, he, he wanted to get it out, and he, he had his fingers up and down the length and even had a go of one of them. Mm. Yeah. And what was it he said, Saf? Oh, I can't remember, but he was just totally gobsmacked. He said, and I, I remember this like it was yesterday, <laughs> possibly because it was. He said, <laughs> we've got to get into these. Yeah. Is, is this Generation 2? No, that's a Generation 3. This is a Generation 2 and showed him um, an ego style. And he said, right, so what does the Generation 3, why are they so much better, what sort, what is involved? And I said, you want to get into them? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, it'll cost you, sorry. Anyway, I said, you'll never get a marketing authorization on them. And he said, oh, we will. I know how. And I said, how do you know <laughs> how? He said, because we've done it thousands of times. We can do it. And I thought that was extremely interesting. It, it actually confirmed to me that Big Pharma is now taking an interest, but they're only taking an interest because they can get MAs, which I think is uh, probably a good point to take the next set of adverts. You've probably gathered by now we're not going to be finishing at 10 o'clock, <laughs> and I'll take the kittens off cat because I think this is too important. When we come back, we'll go through what Jacques Uzek had to say, which I found to be extremely interesting. So recharge your glasses, empty your bladders, refill your cartomizers. We will be back in two minutes. Until then, don't go anywhere.
and that's 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 the second lot of adverts out of the way now we appreciate very very much that a lot of people will be used to leaving us at 10 o'clock and that's dog walking and all that kind of thing and that's great there is some stuff that we do need to cover um so i'm going to kind of skip past things um let's just say that you've already all all of you out there have already heard what uh, jacques luzek had to say you've already heard what uh dr Farsalinos had to say i want to jump really to where jeremy mean was and i'm going to throw this one at daz but remind Daz that there are certain words that he wrote on his iPad that he cannot use. Um, <laughs> and, and means, have a, means have a comparing the notes at that time of the words that were typed on the iPads. Yes, and, that, that can't use. And, and yes, I think there were more words that you can't use than there were, were if, if, you, if you want to put it that way. Um, if we can quickly cover what, what Jeremy said, because it's very important that people are aware of what the MHRA take on it is now, because that informs action that we need to take as of now. So, Daz, it's over to you. Okay. Well, the the what I picked up off what uh, Jeremy Mean was saying. Um, uh, one of the sentences that I've got here is using nicotine replacement therapy as it is now in medicine framework. That it is. He, he mentioned about it being advertised. Um, so he was. He was basically what he was doing is he was trying to say that if they use electronics, um, if they put electronic cigarettes under uh, medicinal, that it wasn't going to be a bad thing. Did you believe was, that? No, not at all. Definitely not because he was he was saying, oh, we can we can blitz it all up, we can bling it. Um, you make it out that um, you know you've got to go and, and just get it off the doctor. That's not the case. You can buy it off the shelf, just like you can with a with a box of paracetamol or hemorrhoid well, cream. Well, that's it. And, and, and actually, one of the sentences that I put on is the fact that um, at one point I was like, "Is Jeremy Mean trying to um, simil make Asics um, similar to athlete's foot cream?" Because he did at one point start showing us pictures of all different sorts of athletes foot cream, and I thought, and I, I got a bit confused at that point. You um, got confused. <laughs> and he also made a little mention as well, which which I kind of expected about um, exploding batteries, um, even though um, it, that, that's been a very very small proportion but I did expect them to do that at the same time yeah. I was expecting them to look at the things that maybe haven't gone so well and try and use that as like these little bits to have a dig so to put it more in his favor yeah. and ultimately on top I mean we had a bit of a debate about it on the train but I really felt like he talked to us like we were children a yeah. lot of the time it's, as well yeah. Sav, your yeah. Take? yeah I was gonna say I'll jump in with I've I highlighted some of the, the notes that I've got and the things I've highlighted of what Jeremy Mean said and he used this repeatedly over and over and over again. The words flexible framework for meds rigs. Mm. Mm. Over and over and over again. Um, he also said, I mean, yeah, we've got the, the think of the children argument mm -hmm. and the exploding batteries argument. Mm -hmm. He talked a lot about the cost of meds rigs but never elaborated <laughs> on what we would be expecting on that well if i can, uh, if i can just jump in there he was he yep. was explicitly asked what the cost of med regs would be now you know when a liar's got it wrong a liar has to have a good memory and he's never explicitly stated what the cost of medicinal regulation would be and when he was asked the question directly he said well i actually i don't i don't have those figures to hand um which basically means is they're way too high and if i tell you there'll be hell on is what he meant uh, he, yep. uh, at the risk of interrupting yourself because I am aware because it was you that told us that we have to watch the schedule um, he came across to me like a snake oil salesman mm -hmm. that was exactly the way he came across and it means that basically is what we've got to got to rebuff and what we need to be talking to MPs about at which point I think Jerry would probably like to chime in Jerry yeah, I mean, I found Mean to be very defensive and quite insulting in the level of, in the way he was talking to people. He clearly hasn't um, shifted. Uh, he was trying to address some of the criticisms that have been raised about you know, the effect of med regs on innovation and that story about, you know, painkillers and antifungal, you know, 
an athlete's foot creeds were just kind of pretty daft things. I mean, basically, we know that the pharmaceutical industry is not very innovative when it comes to these kinds of products. We have seen hardly any, in, any innovation in NRT products over the last 30 years. Um, the emphasis, as, as Sav said, you know, kept talking about the flexible approach, the light touch, and we know that's a nonsense in the UK in terms of the, uh, the scale of um, documentation that is required to make an application, the length of time it takes. I mean, the Nico Venture application went in at the I think, end of 2012, uh, still won't be through until first or second quarter next year. And that's for a single product, let alone, you know, when you've got product variations. So there's no shift there. And I think that's the corner that the UK government is going to continue to argue through the Council of Ministers um, in the European legislative process. The new Minister for Public Health sort of hinted in it. There was a statement in the House um, two or three weeks ago, and I don't have the wording in front of me, but she said, you know, we favour med regs, but uh, we realise there's a big argument and it's rather contentious. And I can't say much, you know, we're, we're sort of looking at it, I can't say too much more at the moment. It was a hint that there was a bit of flexibility. But listening to Jeremy Mean, it was a complete defence of the position that they've adopted since... Um, the middle of the year, no, no weakening there. So it, it, it comes on to really what's got to be done now in the UK and in Europe. We all got very busy up until the 8th of October and then took you know, a bit of a rest, had a good triumph in the European Parliament. But this process is going on now in the, in the European legislative process. We've got the Parliament, which is voted for Amendment 170, which is a consumer product type approach. It's got its problems, but it's a consumer product approach. Council is still committed to um, to MedRegs, and you've got the Commission who proposed MedRegs. So you've got those three parties who've got to negotiate their way through all this, and the, the clock is ticking. And as far as we know, Dave, they're going to discuss the eSig issue on, I think, the third of December and possibly also the 16th of December. Th but positions will be, is that right? Yeah. I think yeah. they discussed it yesterday, actually. Did they? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, um, so, so we've got to take action and we've got to take it now, haven't we, really? Yeah, exactly. We, we've, got to, we've got to kick into gear again. We've got to start writing to MEPs, but also got to write to MPs and through MPs to target the, the, the Minister for Public Health. And I think the awareness amongst MPs is much less than the awareness that you all created amongst MEPs. You know, tremendous job done from sort of March onwards this year. Most MEPs have not heard about this issue, didn't think it was any, anything at all. Most people thought the TPD would go through. Nobody could have, none of the MEPs, I think, would have predicted that the e cigs would have been the real battleground in the, the legislative process. So we've got to ramp up the effort towards MEPs to remind them what they voted for and to remind them to keep their tabs on what Linda McCavan is doing in the negotiations in what's called the trilogue between council, um, commission and, and parliament. But also we've got to get at uh, UK government through MPs and tell them what's at stake here. Indeed. Now, one of the things that we noticed yesterday um, while we were showing all these various different mods and devices to all kinds of people, whether they were from smoke-free partnerships, whether they were doctors that originally wanted to prescribe, whether they were uh, public health people, you know, that, that, that were kind of controlling and, and, and all of this kind of thing. What we discovered was they understood a lot better because there were many more than one of us at any given point in time. During the course of, of, of one of the discussions, I asked all of the vapors in the room to hold up what they'd been using, and heads were turning, and you can hear. You could see the faces of people that didn't know going, what the hell? They're all different. There are no two the same. And it occurred to me that when you're talking to your MP, and you should be talking to your MP, writing a letter's good, but actually going with the gear, mob handed, four or five of you, each using what you use and telling your story as a group, 
to your local MP if yesterday is anything to go by and indeed what we've done talking to MEPs in Brussels and other places when they see this gear when they see that everybody's using something different then they get that it's not like an aspirin it's not like hemorrhoid cream it's not like athlete's foot cream it's not like any medicine there has ever been because everybody but everybody is using something that suits them and when Sav was saying well I've got 18 milligram in this and she well, I, I can't even remember what you held up Sav but it was a, an eye test just a, a one of them yes so she's she's holding up something that's square and eight inches long I'm holding this up with the the the, the, the squid they're going but why do you use different things? It's because they do different things. They do the same thing, but they do it differently. I use much heavier juice. And then they could see uh, Mark Jones was using one of his own boxes. They could see Gary Dibley was using something else. They could see all of the vapors using different things while we were networking. Yeah, and I mean, sorry to jump in there, Go Dave, on. but there was even when um, me and Mark were showing people the, the devices on the table, there was one woman that was asking about the difference in the way you exhale vapour and everything. She was completely fascinated with the fact that some people exhale quite a lot of visible vapour, other people don't. So she wanted to know, is there a right way or a wrong way to use them? And we said, no, that's the beauty of them. You use them how it works for you, how it suits you. If you want to take small little draws on it, great. If you want to take big, long, long inhales on it, great. You can. Yeah, ab and ab absolutely. She was fascinated with that. Yeah, I, I, my, my feeling is, and, and th this isn't just a gut feeling, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced. If you can take a group of you and, and, and two or three of your mates that live locally to go and see your MP and take your gear and let them see it, let them play with it, let them handle it, let them understand that this isn't a one size fits all situation, that these things cannot be as prescriptive as medicines are because they need, in order to be really effective for everybody, to be tailored to everybody on an individual basis and the, obviously the mechanisms for doing that are available because we're already doing it. The bricks and mortar stores are doing it. People like Mark Shaw is doing it. People like Dazit Safer Sigs are doing it. He gets phone call after phone call asking where do I go next, what can I try next. This kind of thing is the mechanism for, for, for what is a public health dividend of massive proportions. And the best part about it is, it's all by choice. Nobody's forced down any one route. But under medicinal regulation, you would be forced down one route. You would be given one choice. Because under meds regs, everything's got to work the same. That's pretty much the situation. And I don't think MPs are aware of that. And fortunately, you watching this now are in a position to make them aware of that you have the knowledge you have the expertise you have the passion and i'm begging of you use it please now as quickly as you can get to your mps ring their constituency offices up and make an appointment to go to their next clinic surgery what the hell ever it is they called wherever they're going to meet you accept no excuses insist upon it they have to see you they need to see you and you need to see them have i ranted enough sav <laughs> that'll do it yeah is that all right jerry that's perfect let's go kick it into gear from tomorrow you heard it jerry told you there's the man yeah. there's the man that's... yeah and someone in chat said and this is not just in the uk everybody everywhere across europe completely everywhere across and do it in america as well doesn't matter where in the world you are go and see your representative take two or three or four of you down show them everything you've got tell them why it works for you tell them why it'll work for everybody else and tell them why medicinal regulation will not work i might have said that yesterday mm. yeah i did I did. Um, 
okay that's that's the 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 plea done let's let's just carry on i think with um who shall we go to next who was who was really worth listening to lorian he was really what, what? So we're not talking about Mean anymore, presumably. Oh, he's had enough out of us. We've given him enough <laughs> time. He's we've a... done with him. Yeah, we're done and with him. He, let's let's. We need, to, we need to talk about Clive. We do need to talk about Clive because we know that every time he speaks, he has such an impact because the way he presents himself. And yet again, yesterday he did us so proud. Um, oh, I'm very much focusing that... on. Sorry, <laughs> you're that's... looking for slides. <laughs> I'm looking for slides. Yes. <laughs> he um he very heavily relies on the fact that what's being forgotten in all of this are the people that matter, um and I think that's probably the most important thing. It's all very well looking at the figures in between, but at the bottom line, he had this amazing visual image to ha to help us uh, visualise a million people, and it was a double decker bus, a single decker bus, I beg your pardon, made of piles of pennies, and the if you were to make a double a single decker bus with piles of pennies, you had a billion people. And it was a very striking image to get in. Oh, I think there's probably got it um, to get into your head. Actually, just the, how many people are affected by this issue? Yes, a, a single deck. It takes five single decker buses made out of pound, uh, piles of one penny coins. That's oh. what a billion looks like. Five single decker buses made out of one penny coins is what a billion looks like. And that's how many lives are at stake. Sorry, Lorian, carry on. No, no, but the thing is, it's that, it is that simple. It's actually remembering who is at stake here. While they're trying to um, make the perfect product that um, can be perfectly regulated and is, and is perfect and is clinical, um, that we actually don't want that. And because they don't get that, these are the figures that we're looking at that potentially over a period of time are going to be affected by this very narrow view that they've picked up. Um, just as ever, he does such a wonderful job of, of putting that across. Uh, uh, you, you, are, you are absolutely right. Um, and, and not only he, but also um, Professor Flau, um, yeah. Jacques Luzek, uh, Jean-Francois Etter, yeah. they all quoted similar figures where they said that every year since 2002, when snus was banned, had it not been banned and it had gone around Europe, 92,000 deaths per year. That's very nearly a million people have died because of the snus ban. And this is not something that needs to happen with e-cigs. That's something else that's worth looking at. And he came up with what I thought was a, a brilliant graphic, which I'm going to put on screen now. Um, and this was... The counterproductive side, medicines, and the harm-reducing side. So where safety is, 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 is concerned, medicines wants the safest possible. That's counterproductive because all it needs is safe enough. In quality terms, he was talking about control processes and good manufacturing pra practice. Just needs proportionate standards. In terms of efficacy, the regulator decides. And I have to say, Jeremy Mean was not very happy when I told him he had no right to decide that because the consumer decides what efficacy is. In terms of labelling, labelling under med regs would warn of danger where it should encourage switching. Marketing would be like medicines and I'm sorry I've never yet seen a sexy medicine. Even Durex marketing's not sexy. Other condoms and marital aids are available of course. But it should be marketed like consumer products. I'm not going to say VIP but you know what I mean. There should be no bans on use because it normalises harm reduction. Retail should be general sales anywhere and everywhere. Age restrictions, they would have it only for adults. In actual fact, it actually makes little difference because nicotine's no more dangerous than caffeine. And taxation, there should be a fiscal incentive to switch. I'm going to throw it across to the Hangout and see what, what they thought. Who, will, who shall we start with? Mark Shaw. Yeah. Yeah, well... Clive made the good point as well. He basically said, uh, if you've got something that's 99% safe, making it 99.9% .9 safe is totally irrelevant. And I thought that was quite a good good quote that he used there. I thought that was actually bang on. You know, as he said, it, it, you, when you're talking about risks, you've got to calculate these risks. And so far, the evidence is showing that the risks of vaping, uh, uh, you know, it. it how much safer can make it, if you get what I mean? And 
I, I really wanted, I had my hand up during that Q&A session because I wanted to ask Jeremy Mean and uh, Linda Bold, is NRT 100% safe? Because it's not. It's under medicinal, medicinal, medicinal regulation and, you know, I, I know adverse effects to NRT. You know, you could take Champix, for example. There's people who have had, you know, the worst adverse effect you could possibly have from it, <laughs> which is death. So uh, I thought you made a good point there. With, you know, how safe can you actually make something? Yes, indeed, indeed. Mark Jones, what did you think? Well, I agree uh, a lot with Mark said. Uh, about the 99% safe, you could possibly make them 100% safe, but you probably end up with something that nobody actually wants to use. It'd be boring. So you, it would just if nobody's using it, there's no point in it being 100% safe. Indeed. And uh, Daz, Darren Johnson? Can you unmute? He can't <laughs> unmute. <laughs> Got him again. I, I, I just, I there, we go, there we go. Sorry about that. My mute sticks sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I think um, another point as well, which hasn't been picked up, which I'm sure Clive had said, is and I think it was more of a statement than anybody else in saying if this were to be medicinalized we will take it to court and we will win because other countries are winning uh, when they're taking it to court to say no these should not be medicinalized and he was more or less saying we will take it to the high court if we have to and we will win yes Gary what did you pick up again I, th I think the biggest the biggest thing for me there was was when like Mark was saying um, you know the calculated risk thing and you know we're all adults and and it i think when when we originally looked at, at, at this product um whatever shape form or whatever we looked at it in we made that calculated risk at that time of purchase um you know it's the same with with the you know with nrt i had big problems with patches this that, and the other but never had a problem with vaping i think the the other thing that that sort of um struck me I, I think uh, at one point he did sort of not directly challenge the press but all sort of said said to the press in a way um, you know the way that you guys are reporting these products you are effectively putting people at risk yes yes <clears throat> absolutely right and and the BMA is doing exactly the same thing and because the BMA which let's face it is only a trade union keeps coming out with its scaremongering stuff they're causing deaths I, I think it not now, but further down the road. I think it's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Uh, interesting what uh, Mark Shaw picked up about things, about NRT not being safe. Jacques Luzek and Dr. Farsalinos both said the same thing, that it is absolutely impossible when you are extracting nicotine from tobacco not to get some very, very small, barely detectable amounts of nit nitrosamines in their carcinogens. And I'm kind of leaping ahead a little bit here. I'm going to miss Lynn Bald out. Uh, we were going to cover her, but frankly, she and her friend, um, yes, the name's gone out of <laughs> my head. Isn't that nice that I've been able to forget the name, but not the face? Well, that's bosom buzzy. Yes, <laughs> yes. There, there was a little bit of, uh, that was going on a bit, wasn't it? <laughs> okay. No loss, love loss between. Yeah, I, yes, I think it's very, very safe to say. I'm, I'm going to move on to Deborah Arnott. And I'm sorry to upset people, but I'm going to move on to Deborah Arnott. And while I'm, I'm putting these, this, this slide up on screen for everybody to have a look at, because you'll see the names Anna Gilmore and Sylvie Peters there, and you can also see where they receive their funding. Um, bearing in mind what was said by. Luzek, Farsalinos, and everybody else, actually, that was a proper doctor, a proper academic, a proper researcher, they all said, yeah, patches have got uh, nitrosamines in, the inhalator's got nitrosamines in, and then let's, let's leave this stupidity about her doing a research on Wikipedia out of it. Chime in any time you like, Lorian, but don't swear. <laughs> <laughs> what, about... Um... What? About which bit particularly? Well, it's a great, great, great place to do your research, isn't it, Wikipedia? Because that's... Oh, oh, yeah, no, it is. It is the font of all absolute accurate knowledge. I mean, it's, yeah, it, it is, to us lay people, it is the Bible of our information. Absolutely. Yeah, but not for somebody that's supposed to know what they're talking about, surely. No, it isn't at all, actually. Everything <laughs> that you read on Wikipedia, you would cross-reference everywhere else. You would never rely on Wikipedia for your information for anything. 
No, no, you wouldn't. You absolutely wouldn't. Um, but anyway, yes, she went on. She was, she was quite. I thought quite reasonable when she was she was talking about uh, how businesses operate and how the tobacco industry doesn't actually behave much worse than any other industry. They're all pretty much the same. But she was at very great pains to point out that uh, the tobacco industry is moving into ASIGs like we didn't know. Uh, Nico Ventures, she said, is owned by BAT, which it is. CN Creative is owned by BAT. Blue is owned by Laurelard. Dragonite has been bought by Imperial Tobacco. And Skysig has been bought by Laurelard. And uh, there are lessons to learn and all the rest of it. And yet, she was told by Robert West and by Flau and by Etta and by just about everybody else that medicinal regulation would hand a monopoly to the tobacco industry. Then she went, she went on to say a little later on, and indeed in the interview that we played in at the beginning of the show, that it's quite possible, you know, that e-cigarettes contain carcinogens, going back to the 2009 research, and I call it research like that, that was done by the FDA, and that we won't know for 10 or 12 or 15 years whether they're going to do any harm. Even when she'd been told by Robert West, Antoine Flau, Jean-Francois Etter, Jacques Leuzek, um, all of them, all of them, that that actually isn't the case. She still went there. I'm going to go to the hangout and ask you what you think about that. And seeing as how Mark shows up first, Mark, it's over to you. Yeah, well, she, she did actually concede that Medregs would hand uh, the, the industry to the tobacco industry and the farm. Industry. She did have that. What she was trying to defend it with was well, we'd be able to monitor them because she said, well, that can mean anyway that the tobacco industry are moving in and then sort of like went on to say about that the medicinal regulation and yes, they most likely would be the only ones being able to afford it. She did actually concede that point. Uh, but what, it, what, what I've got from that is, and, and as Chris Snowden picked up in his blog today, is there's this, you know, is this about public health or is this about destroying the tobacco industry? Because from what I got from Deborah Arnott, is she's more concerned about destroying the tobacco industry and goddamn everybody else and, and you know, whatever the health effects are, it doesn't matter. Uh, she's just scared about profits and what they've done in the past. But she also conceded again that every industry, you know, just because with the, the tobacco industries, dirty washing has been done out to, to everyone to see, basically. But she conceded that near enough every industry that works for profit, as it, you know, it, it crosses what we would say moral ground, if you get what I mean. Yeah. And that's what that's what I got from it is it's it's more to do with a war on tobacco industry, and you know, public health takes a, a back seat to that. That that was the total impression I got from her presentation. Yeah, I've got, I've got to say, I, get, I do get the impression that uh, they seem to have lost track of what the real enemy is, and the real enemy happens inside here. COPD and lung cancer and stuff like that, and I think they're seeing the tobacco industry as the enemy rather than the end result of their product. Sav, have you got uh, stuff to add from that? Because we haven't really taken a lot from chat tonight so far. Um, I haven't got anything from chat, but one comment, because um, chat's not playing nice for me tonight. Ah. Um, so Blaze has said, tobacco control promoting tobacco companies, you couldn't make it up. And I've got nothing to add on Deborah Arnott, because I stopped taking notes when I discovered her notes were from Wikipedia. I thought I'll just get them off there later. <laughs> <laughs> Does seem fair. Jerry, have you got anything to add to that? She's in an incredibly difficult position, and I don't think she's playing her hand very well. I think she's uh, looking quite beleaguered. Within the tobacco control field, she is viewed as quite a radical harm reductionist, and she has you know, she's pushed liberalisation of NRT. But you know, she's seen as being quite to the left. You know, where we see her as a big obstacle. And I think she got into the med regs in part because it was a way of placating the more sort of the, 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 the tough people who she has to deal with, you know, saying supports e cigs but they need tougher um, regulation. But when you hear her present 
I mean, she sort of plucks facts out of the air and she sort of always tries to be in there with some sort of killer anecdote or fact to try to knock somebody else down. And I think that Ash is really getting to be in a really tricky position. I mean, not, not financially, and they've got CRUK, they've got massive funds behind them, but they're no longer leading in a way that they should be leading on this new issue. They've got no feel for what this is. They've got no strategy for engaging with vapors. They've always seen it as a war on industry and a war on smokers. So their mindset is always control, control, control. So, you know, control everything to do with tobacco. And when e-cigs come along, well, kind of it's another thing to control. And that's kind of the mess that TPD is as well, because it's a, it's a controlling tobacco products directive rather than promoting public health uh, directive. So that I, I really feel that you know, there's a real problem for organizations like ASH because most NGOs have a loyal following of a large community that they're trying to represent. Now, they just don't have that. You know, their community is the other co tobacco control people. So she's in a real spot here. And I, I don't know how we kind of help her to extricate herself from this, uh, along with the other people who have supported Medrex, because sooner or later they need to find a way to change their position and, and save face. But she's not making a very good um, uh, you know, show of it at the moment. I mean, it's brave of her to attend, and we know that a lot of the other tobacco control types didn't attend, and in fact tried to disrupt the... the, the the meeting, so it's good yes. that she's there. Yes, I mean, all, all kudos to her for turning up, yeah. and Martin Donkrell, yes. But yes. she's no longer a convincing voice in this um, in this debate. Well, you, you, you're right in what you say. I, uh, I agree exactly with what you say. She's not. Um, but we did hear some very convincing voices, and I'm, I'm aware of the time. I want to try and pull this together for in another 10 minutes. Um, and I'm going to embarrass somebody that's here tonight, and I'm, I'm not even going to apologise for doing this, but I think we saw a new leader emerge yesterday, is what I think, mm -hmm. um, in the very last person to join in the very last segment of the last panel. Uh, a voice came out of the wilderness and I thought did an extremely good job, and I'm going to throw it across to the Hangout for their yeah. comments. It's pointless, pointless me asking <laughs> the voice herself. Does? Um, yeah, I know exactly who you're going on about, and um, I, I, for one, was just absolutely, totally gobsmacked and commented several times, and just want to um, congratulate Lorian on an absolutely amazing job. I mean, everybody that challenged Lorian, she stumped them. And she stumped them well and truly. And I'm sorry, Lorian, but I'm going to quote you here because in my notes, which I took the day, um, somebody in the in the audience stood up, and I think how she handled this was absolutely amazing. I really was. And, and basically, a woman stood up during and said um, she raised the issue about uh, because we've been talking about passive smoking. She raised the issue about being around vapors today, and she didn't like it because she had a bad head. And I put Lorian apologised in regards to that, saying that it is extremely rare for something like this to occur. But at the same time, we had given up tobacco, which was a danger of passive smoking, and she can't have it always. And uh, which followed with an absolutely instant round of applause from uh, from many of the audience members. So well done, Lorian. Absolutely true. Um, Mark Jones? I just have to say she handled the, the whole thing so amazingly well. I was incredibly impressed. There you go. Mark Shaw? Yeah, well, she was amazing, absolutely amazing. Even when Dr. Farsalinos, you know, came out and saying what, what was Echo doing and stuff like that to, uh, to, to make sure that, you know, that the vendors were playing ball and everything like that. Lorian, you really did. You came across so well, and I'm never going to tell you I've got an headache. <laughs> <laughs> Sav? Yeah, I have to agree with what everybody said. Lorian was absolutely amazing. And just to go back to what Daz was saying about the lady who had the headache, uh, another thing that Lorian said was that we've been so ed well educated, it's not the word, it's been drilled into us and rammed down our throats that smoking is bad. Just the visual appearance of it could be what she was reacting to. 
And I thought that was an excellent comment. She handled it so well. She did. I agree. I agree 100%. As I say, I think we have a star in the ascendant. Um, I think a new leader was revealed to us yesterday. Um, and I'm ever as pleased that she's involved with Eka. I'm just going to switch to her camera because she's looking very sheepish at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got a glorious shade of red there, Lorian. I but, have. Uh, probably has. Very warm in here. Ah, uh, that's what it is, is it? OK, that's fair enough. Um, I thought you did a cracking job. I thought you did an absolutely cracking job yesterday. In fact, I'm going to I'm going to say that it's not wasn't just Lorian that did a cracking job. All of the vapors that were there representing the whole of the community. I was so proud to be part of that cohort of people that were there from this community. They conducted themselves absolutely perfectly. They were so informative to people that were asking questions. There were conversations going on in the breaks over lunch and what have you where they were being asked questions to mark and, and, and just you know that you were there. I'm, I'm not going to name everybody by name but everybody conducted themselves in a manner that must I feel have impressed those in, in, in public health and from big tobacco and from big pharma everybody that wasn't a vapor have has got to have been impressed by the way you people conducted yourselves there I was so proud to be part of that and thank you so much for turning out to represent the community the way you did it was phenomenal to watch and I for one came away from yesterday filled with optimism and I think I used the phrase we will win this and I think we will I think we have the information I think we have the will and I think we have the wherewithal the intestinal fortitude the ability to get out there and educate people that need to be educated as to why these things are as good as they are. It, 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 it filled me with all kinds of emotions and I was bouncing on the train going back and bouncing stood outside the pub inside the red line. It was too full to get in. <laughs> Jerry, I'm, I'm going to ask you one more time, uh, if you will please, just to let everybody know that we need them to act and act now. We do. We've had a triumph. I can't think of any other area of social activism which has had such a good and quick result. Just think back to the discussions we had at the very beginning of the year when the uh, you know, people were just beginning to get active politically and turned around what happened in the European Parliament. It wouldn't have happened without the vapors, all of you, putting pressure on MEPs. We've got so far, uh, we've now got to push it through to the finish. We've got to continue in arguing against med rates. Um, you know, we may or may not like Amendment 170, but it is better than the alternative. You know, many of us would like e-cigs completely, completely out of the TPD, but whenever you argue, argue against medregs and all the damage medregs will do to the products that you know and love. So that's, you know, it's still the save e-cigs, it's all medregs will destroy what we've got. That's the argument. You know, the niceties about how they're dealt with, you know, that can be dealt with in, you know, in due course, but for God's sake, you know, keep medregs out of this. And it needs everybody to make that message uh, to MPs and to MEPs. Exactly, exactly right. Thank you for that, Jerry. The time has come for us to go, I think. Um, and I want to say a big thank you to everybody that's joined me tonight. It's been technically quite a challenge to make it all work, but I hope it has. I hope it's all continued to go out. Um, so it's a big thank you to Mark Short, to Oliver Kershaw, to Mark Jones, to Gary Dibley, to Darren Johnson, to Lorian C., I never use your full name, do I? Uh, <laughs> to Jerry Stimson for joining me tonight. And as ever, I'll throw it to Sav because the last word usually comes from chat if it's working at all. Sav? <laughs> well, I haven't got anything from chat. So I think, let's have a look at my notes. Who have I got? Oh, I'll give the last word to Jean-Francois Etty, who said, 
First, apply and enforce an existing regulation, and only if they are proved ineffectual should a custom regulation be looked at, not meds regs. And there you go. On that note, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Thank you to everybody on the panel. Thanks to the rest of the VT team for all the backup that you, uh, you give us during the course of the shows. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. Um, I'll see you tomorrow night, probably on me Todd. Keith won't be with me. So God only knows what I'm going to do. I'll have to banter with myself. Or just, well, actually, I'll banter with Kat. And if I can drag somebody in off the streets, I will. But thank you so much for watching. We do appreciate you coming along every week to spend the time with us. Um, until we see you next time. From everybody here, who I think is, is really happy that things are going well, good night. Ve on. Ve pard. And nil carborundum illegitimai. Cheerio, bye. See you next time. Bye. Good night. Bye. I've been conducting research into...